As president and producer of Disney Theatrical Productions, Thomas Schumacher is one of the most influential leaders in the Broadway community. Celebrating 25 years since their arrival on the scene with Beauty and the Beast, Disney Theatrical is currently responsible for the amazingly long-running The Lion King, the high-flying hit Aladdin, and their newest smash, Frozen, now starting its second year. Hear the creative exec talk about his early days on the stage, the origin stories of some of his biggest successes, and his grandfatherly love of his Disney family on this week's Show People. Thank you for being here, Tom. Wouldn't miss it. This is such a big, uh, actually a milestone for you. You are hitting a milestone in your career. We at Disney Theatrical are hitting a milestone. It's 25 years since Beauty and the Beast opened on Broadway, right. which probably makes you feel very old. <laughs> well, I was around for that. That's so, what I mean. Yeah, see? so I, I actually remember it happening, and I remember what the Broadway scene was like then and, and what it was like to have Disney arriving with this. We obviously weren't the first people to do a family musical, right? Certain generations would say, oh, the first musical I saw was The King and I, or it would be The Sound of Music, or it would be Annie. So when we came along with Beauty and the Beast, which had already been nominated for an Oscar right. and all that stuff, but it did bring a very different audience than what people were expecting on Broadway. Everybody says Beauty and the Beast is their first show. Which was interesting about that show because it was both a date night show uh -huh. and a kid show, right? The number one merchandise item why this is relevant, only because it indicates the romance of it, were those roses. Mm. By the way, what a great thing. Get a silk rose, put a Beauty and the Beast label on it, and sell it for $1,000 <laughs> or whatever we charge for it. But people bought them like crazy because they were on dates at the same time that there's some you know, little boy or girl in their princess dress. I feel like I've met a lot of like Jersey guys who are like, I'm going to bring my girl to Beauty and the Beast and like got the, scored them points. Yeah, that's happening now too, though. Oh, yeah. At Aladdin, that's happening sure. at Frozen. That's Aladdin particularly gets yeah. it because Aladdin has this fun nostalgia thing going on. Yep. And I always like to say that the Aladdin kind of grew up when you were 12 and you first saw it back in 1992, you know, you're like a real adult, potentially even with your own kids, but you come on a date because you have all these nostalgia points mm -hmm. about it. And we deliver those moments, but we do it slightly meta. We're very, we're very aware of ourselves and the fact that the thing has grown up with you. So we cast it older. We don't cast it with teenagers. Mm -hmm. And that's all because we know who that audience is. So that's interesting because if you think back on Beauty and the Beast, the stage production of Beauty and the Beast was not that. It, it, no. it, it, was, it was much closer to something you would see at Disney World. Is that fair to say? Well, I think what, what is fair to say, I, I wouldn't argue that point. When you go to the park, you want to see an exact recreation. Yeah. And so the intention was to give you the movie on stage. Mm -hmm. And that, that was how we started. Mm -hmm. But it was expanded. You're right. I mean, there were, there were a lot of... Oh, there's, there's, fantastic. there's songs that we'd cut from the movie. Yeah. Tim Rice came onto it. But the look of it, the feel of yep. it. And in fact, right now we're working on a revival of it with the entire original team, but in a complete new design for every element and new dance arrangements, new, new whole new staging ideas, which is really fun for that team now to be able to dive back in. We've, done a, we've all together done a couple of versions. We have one playing in Shanghai now that isn't a copy of Broadway. Um, in Mandarin. I'm sure you're dying to see that in Mandarin, but I bet you'd follow it. Sure. It's fun to reinvent them and go back in, and now to really do a proper revival is exciting. Well, that's interesting. I mean, you, you haven't done a revival yet, Disney Theatrical. No. I mean, we won't, not on Broadway, and, right. and we're doing this actually to tour as well. Right. What was opening night of Beauty and the Beast, 1994? What was it like for you? Did, did Disney feel like outsiders. You're the chairman of the board of the Broadway League now. You are very much a huge part of the industry and the community and a leader in this world. But did it, did it f what, what did it well, feel what, like back then? Uh, what ha was happening, keep in mind that when we did Beauty and the Beast, people did not think, right? When that team, and I did not, I did not mount Beauty and the Beast. When that team did Beauty and the Beast, it was just a one-off. Right. There was no big idea right. of being on Broadway. We were developing, uh, re rehabbing the new Amsterdam Theater at the time. Mm -hmm. Our then chairman, Michael Eisner, had already begun that commitment, and that was well underway. But there wasn't this giant, uh, there, was, there was no plan, really. Mm -hmm. And now we're just fully part of everything. We have three shows running. We've, we've had things that worked, things that didn't work. I think people have realized we're just like them, mm -hmm. except we have some extraordinary IP to work with. You are a real theater person. And I know a lot of theater people, when they have projects that maybe don't work in, in the way that some things really do work, they get kind of obsessed with <laughs> what could have 
then I mean, look at like Stephen Sondheim and Merrily We Roll Along, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> I relate to like that. I relate to Steve on that because they have gone back in and back in and back in, and then they let other people take a whack at right. it. Right. Yeah. Um, and Do you see, have that at all? Do you think? Well, about yes, because fortunately, we've only had two shows that were com that, for in our definition, are a swing and a miss, mm -hmm. and that would be Tarzan and Mermaid. Right. Now, mind you, each one ran a year and a half or whatever. So, right. from that, but in our sense of the world. Yeah. They didn't really land. Something that we did about putting it together didn't work right. But in both of those cases, we were able to, because of our international reach and the potential of this IP, we reinvented. So just this fall, I was in Germany closing the 10-year run of Tarzan. Right. And we've had great success with that. And, um, and certainly Mermaid. There's two productions in Japan. We've mm -hmm. done it in, in the Netherlands. And of course, we've reworked it enough that it gets licensed everywhere. So yeah. they both have actually economically paid back, which is nice. You know, you, you like to not fail that way. But also, I think creatively, getting a second chance at it, trying to figure out what the connection is to make it right, is enormously gratifying. You have brought a lot of Disney magic to the stage. Uh, we will be back with more Thomas Schumacher right after this. <laughs> and we are back with Thomas Schumacher. Disney theatrical. Still here. I tried to leave, but they've they locked nope, the door. Still here. We have a lot. You can't even get out of this can't room. Can't get out. It's locked. So let's go back to California. You you are a real California. I'm a fourth generation. Fourth generation. Fourth, yeah. My great grandmother was born in Benicia, California, and my grandfather on that side was born in the same house. Do you keep a residence in California? No, I haven't lived in California since I think 2004. For a, for between 97 and 2004, I commuted back and forth. Mm -hmm. But now we're here completely. So right. I'm in the city, and then I have a place upstate. So when you were uh, growing up back in California, it sounds like you were quite a huffer. You, you, well, your, your dancing is still talked about, isn't it? Well, yes, people, um, people die to see it. Natasha Katz filmed me tap dancing in the Doge's Palace in Venice a couple of years ago, and that video has been seen everywhere because <laughs> the place was empty for a party we were having. And uh, she shot it, and there I am. But no, I, what I did is I, I was a theater kid, right? So I grew up outside of San Francisco uh -huh. in a city called San Mateo, yep. California. I grew up, you know, I had a very active community theater. I didn't do much theater in school, but I had a very active community theater. And okay. my community recreation center hired me at 16 to direct. So I was mm -hmm. directing kids a little bit younger than me. Professional, I was working for the city directing, and I was doing theater. And I was the custodian at Burl Davis's Dance Art Center. And if, I was, if the mirrors were clean and the floors were clean every morning, I got to take class. And uh, James Eigelhart learned how to tap dance for Aladdin in the same studio wow. that I used to clean. But no, so I danced. And then, and then I realized when I went to college that uh, being able to read well out loud isn't acting. A lot of people haven't figured that out, but I could read well out loud, so I thought I was an actor. And this, I, this happened while you were playing Pippin, correct? Yeah, yeah. I did Pippin, Renfield, and Corporal Hamilton Steves in, uh, in South Pacific in Rep, and then understudied Algernon in Importance of Being Earnest. And at the end of that summer season of Summerstock, I took my wig off and said, never again. Went back to school um, wow. for my senior year of UCLA, where I was a theater major, and uh, I was... I was like Matthew Broderick and the producers. I want to be a producer. <laughs> yeah, that's what I wanted. And, um, and I did everything I could. I worked for um, Susan Dietz, who often produces on Broadway. I was yeah. in her box office uh -huh. for the uh, LA Stage Company when she started that. I did everything, anything I could do to stay Yeah, there's a the long theater. list of your uh, former jobs. You, you documented it in your book. In my book for kids, because I wanted kids to know. I mean, I got hired pretty soon after school to work at the Center Theater Group in Los right. Angeles, which was run by Gordon, the great yeah. Gordon Davidson at the time. And I spent five years there, overlapping with other stuff, because I was sometimes project-based, sometimes full-time. But it was, it was a five-year period. But I always want kids to read it. And I gave a talk at the, at the Center Theater Group when we did Aida out in, in, mm. at the Amundsen. And they asked me to talk to families. And there were about 200 people in this rehearsal room, rehearsal room A. And I said, so I need all the young people in the room to stand up. I made them all stand up. I said, now I need you to separate your feet about 12 inches apart. And then they all did that. And I said, now I want you to look at the floor between your feet. And I said, sweeping this floor was my first professional job here wow. at this theater. And I'm very proud of that. I used to have to, I was a production assistant um, on the main stage and had to sweep the floor and wash the coffee cups and drive people to their costume fittings. Luke Gossett Jr. was doing yeah. play with us. And he wouldn't get in my beat up Volkswagen with no seat belts to ride to his costume fitting. So he said, how about you sit in my BMW next to me and I'll drive us to the fitting. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. It was a version of working, you know. <laughs> What's your favorite thing about your job 
now? What really gets you excited to go to work? And your, your job seems like it's sort of, you do a lot of things. You're well, we're big, yeah. a lot of things. Because we have so many shows running. My favorite part is, is the period of creation. Mm -hmm. The now pretty well documented discovery on Aladdin when we were out of town in Toronto right. and the show famously wasn't working. Right. We reworked the whole show without the cast knowing because we couldn't tell them until mm -hmm. we had it. And we didn't tell them until they were leaving town is when they found out. And that's when James Eichelhardt found out his whole role as the genie had been restructured. And watching that for the very first night, watching that just happen when we got it to where it was in a place where the audience was having more fun, it's unbelievably thrilling, unbelievably thrilling. Our business, very different from most other parts of this industry, uh, the inter industry of entertainment, mm -hmm. we get to be together. If you make a movie, you don't see everybody else. Right. You're separated into your thing, you're into your process. The editor isn't sitting there with the actor. The, but we're all in the room together, right? That to me, is so thrilling, and oftentimes it's the same people. Mm -hmm. For me to go sit next to Natasha Katz while she's lighting a show and just watch her do it, I love it. We've done so many shows together. It's the people. I want to know what shows are in your head that maybe, uh, you, you must always have future projects that are, that are always, there are things that develop for many years, right? And then there are sort of these yeah. things that people are really hungry for and certain things that sort oh, of. Well, so yeah, people, people some, sometimes think they want something, right? right. And then you're trying to make something else. So I have projects that I'm excited about that we've been puttering with for a long time. There's not much advantage in announcing things right. just to announce them. You should go make them. Yeah. That being said, I can tell you that sitting with David Yazbek and Bob Martin and Rick Ellis working on The Princess Bride is so unbelievably thrilling, right? And the other day we were sitting, we were doing, we were reading through the, you know, first act of the show, and, and David pulled out his guitar and started playing a song. Everyone at the table was weeping. It was so beautiful, you know, so we're not ready to announce it. Right. I don't, I can't tell you, but I, we're, we're in the middle of working on it. Right. That is very exciting. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. That, yeah. That's definitely one of those one of those dream musicals we yeah. keep hearing about. Broadway come here's all the time from certain Yeah, from certain certain what's happening and where's it yeah. going. That happens, you know, but Sometimes things take a very long time. I have an idea um, for, for something that is not a Disney piece of IP, but is the story of an extraordinary woman inventor. Mm. And I've had this idea for 20 years, and someday, you know, someday mm. there'll be a window. And then Frozen happened like that. Well, Frozen was crazy because I had nothing to do with the movie, and I'd seen a presentation, you know, right. they do those things, like that they would show to marketing people. And I was like, okay, whatever. And then my friends at animation said, you, you should see this. And so at midnight, we screened it. Um, while I was working on Aladdin in Toronto, we screened it um, in, in one of these Disney screening rooms, you know, in this middle of the night, and you know, it's like watching Rocky Horror Show, like, why am mm -hmm. I awake? And I was so captivated immediately that it was a that it was a stage musical, yeah. and that's really because of Bobby and Kristen, right. because of the way they shaped the music, right. that construction of the music, and and how brilliant they did that. And I thought, oh, here we are. And I literally, like, from the theater, called. Cause fortunately, it wasn't by this time. It wasn't one or one thirty in the morning out in California, and I uh, said, when do we start? And that one, you know, it's the unexpected consequences of making a movie that they struggled to make the movie. It was a very hard movie to make. Everyone knows that. Got reinvented right in the middle saying, why is Elsa a villain? Just because she has this curious ability or disability that this thing happens. Why is that a problem? Movie gets reinvented on its feet. We watch it. Goes on stage. Now it's going to be all over the world. Entering its second year on Broadway. Woohoo! Uh, we're going to talk more with Thomas Schumacher after this break. <laughs> with 
Thomas Schumacher. I'm still here. The door seems to be actually <laughs> bolted now. That's the part that's scary. More people call you Tom than Thomas, correct? I mean, you're Tom. Well, you could call me Mr. Schumacher. Mr. And it's Schumacher. No, no, you can, yeah, yeah, Tom is just fine, yeah. Let's talk about The Lion King. Can you imagine a Broadway where The Lion King is not running? Will it oh, run? yeah, I can imagine that. Really? I'm, I mean, because uh, you're actually, you're, you're a producer. You produce it. You're, you you well, keep I'm it moving. I'm terrified of that. You know, there's a lot of companies of The Lion King playing tonight. We've done many, many productions of The Lion yeah. King. And now we're 21 years in New York, 20 years in Tokyo, the 20th anniversary in London comes up this fall. Right. And they're all playing strong because the material is so strong. Julie's concept is so timeless. Mm -hmm. There's the rustics like Timon and Pumbaa, but there's the elegance of Mufasa's mask and mm -hmm. all that stuff still works and, and all that beautiful music works. Um, and if we stay with it and nurture it and treat it like something special, you know, maybe it'll last. But to think it's just going to be here, it certainly isn't on autopilot. Right. Oh, you know? absolutely not. And we've changed it a lot over the years. You know, mm -hmm. we took 12 minutes out on the 12th anniversary, 10th anniversary, because it was still a little long. We've adjusted it. Julie's right. rethought things. We've mm -hmm. come up with some new staging ideas. It's so interesting to be in this place now where you originally were tasked with taking these great Disney movie properties, bringing them to the Broadway stage, creating theatrical versions, and now studios to now taking these musicals and then making live action. It's such an interesting Well, I, I, process. I think the credit for, like, for example, when you look at like the Beauty and the Beast remake, right? Yeah, which you, you worked yeah, on. I, yeah, I was the executive producer of that one. And then, and I'm working Huge on- Huge hit. It was Huge. a big hit, yeah. Huge. Yeah, Bill Condon did beautiful work on it. Yeah. And John Favreau, and I'm also involved in the- um, Lion King. Uh, Lion King movie that comes out in July. and. Favreau is doing something, so you, you guys have just seen that trailer, but it is extraordinary what he's doing. Now, yes, they're taking, for the most part, a big hunk of the movie that many people watching this grew up on a, and making it now seem like it's done with trained lions. Mm -hmm. it's, it's startlingly beautiful, and it's the music you grew up with for the most part. Mm -hmm. That cycle I find interesting. This fascination with these musicals coming back on film and coming in as live action movies, is really the, the bulk of that credit for me goes to the great Howard Ashman and Alan Menken. Because Disney had never properly made a, a musical. Right. They made films with music. So right. think of my favorite one from the earlier era, Lady and the Tramp. Lady and Tramp don't sing ever. Mm -hmm. It's always secondary characters that are mm -hmm. singing. It's the classic kind of Hollywood film musical where there's music, but it's not driving the story. And it was right. Howard who brought the Broadway model into Mermaid yeah. and then when Beauty and the Beast wasn't working as an animated film, it became a musical, and then Howard applied that to that. Mm -hmm. That means a generation grew up with that. And they grew up with MTV and lots of other musical input. But the idea, if you're 35 years old today, to sit in the theater and watch a story that you like, told with music, seems completely natural. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I would argue that that's because this generation was raised right. watching that. And if we get it right, we can both pull on the nostalgia factor of it, that it's a time to return home, but also show you something new. So Belle is a little bit different in Bill Condon's version of the, mm -hmm. of the film, right? She's, and that's good, because mm -hmm. these films adjust themselves for their time. Absolutely. Hercules is another one that <laughs> I hear people a lot mention Hercules as sort of a dream thing, yeah. and, it, and it's, well, it's happening, happening this summer. So what happened with Hercules is I, again, you know, I was there, I mean, I literally was in the room, John Musker and Ron Clements, who created the idea of Hercules, based on a gong show pitch that we used to have the whole staff come in. And then wow. they got paid for it and they got a little screen credit. But a lot of the shows, Mermaid came from a gong show. Um, our film Pocahontas came from a gong show. A lot of them. Aida came from a gong show. So a gong show pitch was an office thing? Yeah, office thing. Anyone in the animation studio. You could be the janitor. You could be the receptionist. Wow. You could be a senior animator, a background painter. And you got, you, you got to come in the room and pitch to me and Peter and Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg for a That's long amazing. time and Roy Disney. Yeah, people would do these funny, elaborate pitches, sometimes really simple. But anyway, Hercules came out of that. Ron and John, we made this movie. Gerald Scarf was the sort of uber thinker for the design of it. Did all the original drawings. Fantastic animation. And the film kind of went, eh. It just broke 100 million, which mm -hmm. wasn't enough back then. Mm -hmm. And people kind of disregarded it. And then people kind of like, well, that was a disappointment. But it lived so strong because of the song Go the Distance, sung mm -hmm. in the movie by Roger Bart. And when that clamshell video came out, People fell in love with it, and they met it on video. Mm. And the advantage for all of us who made movies back then 
these, that some of these films could live on. And same thing for Walt, by the way, because a lot of movies that you think were hits for him weren't. But later, in many, many, in his case, decades and decades and decades later, got reignited. But certainly Hercules was like that. Lear de Bessonet, who's a, such a mm -hmm. gifted, gifted director, and she went to see Alan Menken at his studio upstate, mm -hmm. and she said, what are you doing with Hercules? And then she took it to Oscar Eustace. And so then we all came and met, and the public said, we would like to do this. We've done a couple of readings of it, and Alan uh, Menken and David Zippel, who did the songs for the original, came back, and they've written new material. And it's really fun, and it's very emotional to be in the room with the music and see these glorious actors do it. And now we're going to have the stage full of the community. And, and I get to work with Lear some more, who I just was in the office today. I, I just adore her. And that's fun. And she invented this methodology. And it gives us a chance. It's only, what, seven performances or something. So that, that'll be <laughs> yeah, a bit of a riot to get a ticket. Very different kind of path for Yeah, very for curious. But yeah. why not? We know that f there is no formula to creating anything. Mm. There just isn't. I have this expression I always use, the recipe for success is the formula for failure. Mm. If you think you know how it's done, and you don't approach each one fresh and new. So the way Newsies became a Broadway show right. is totally different than the way Aladdin became a Broadway yeah. show. It's totally different than the way Lion King, which went very, very fast, did. Right. Mary Poppins, you know, mm -hmm. this weird marriage between us and Cameron McIntosh, and we each wanted to do it, and we each had different parts of the rights. So we did it together. All these things have a different path, and this is the path for Hercules. Sometimes it's hard when you've been doing something for a very long time to actually sort of take a breath and go, I hit a milestone. I'm, I, this, this, this is sort of a moment where you're just always like moving forward. It's sometimes it's hard to acknowledge the passage of time. And well, it's hard for lots of reasons. You know, um, I, I don't see them as mine. Um, I see them as ours, mm -hmm. our events, mm -hmm. and I want people to jump in. And, and sometimes it's hard for people who are brand new because they don't even know what all this is. You know, there's always somebody new coming in. Right. But the, it, it is ours. It is this collective experience. And that's the part that makes me emotional. Like, even today, just watching the whole Frozen team gathered as we go on to all these more new productions of it, to sit there and look at Peter Holinsky, who did that extraordinary work on the sound, yeah. you know, and, and Jeremy Chernick, who did all the special effects, you know, and Lorenzo Pizzoni, who who I saw a stunt he did in a production, the last production of uh, Noises Off. Mm. And this guy falls on the stairs and I said, who the hell did that? <laughs> and why don't I know that person? Who staged that? And I don't ever want to do something without Lorenzo Pizzoni now. He's so brilliant, right. you know? To see them all in the room, then I get, I, I become grandpa, which is sad, you know? <laughs> I cry at telephone commercials, things like that. <laughs> and, and, and I cry when I see this, the, the gang all together. It, I, because I believe in them so much. I know it sounds nutty and rambly, but it, it's them. This isn't a singular art form. It isn't. It's a collective art form. And everyone brings something to that thing. Mm -hmm. And I remember it. Who did what? Who said what? Who did? And I can remember going back even on all these movies, you know? And it's little bits by everybody. Little mm -hmm. bits by everybody. I've kept you here too long. Well, I go on. But, it's sad. It's but sad. I go on. The Broadway.com staff would be very upset if I did not ask you uh -huh. if there's any chance we're going to see Aida again. That's another one. People, people want to see Aida. Does well, Elton John want to bring back Aida? Do you? Well, I will tell you because I wouldn't say it, but my pal, Michael Riedel, <laughs> heard about it and leaked it. So, yes, I love Aida. And there was, there's a lot of blood on the ground around Aida. So yes, we're in the middle of developing AIDA. We're going to do a little bit of a reading very soon. David Henry Wong is doing some stuff with the script. The director is Shelley Williams, who actually was Nehebka in the original production. Of course. Production. Shelley and, Williams, fantastic. And Shelley and I have been meeting over the years about lots of things, a lot. And we've spent a lot of time together. Uh, she's spectacular. And I was talking to Bob Crowley about what the changes, because we, we want to keep the, the essence of what he had created originally, but of course for today. And we were going over it, and I said, God, it needs to be somebody to do this that's of today, that is appropriate for it, but also who, who knows what it was and what it could become. And, all, but, and I kept describing, and finally I said, you know, I'm just describing Shelley. <laughs> so, and Bob said, well, let's have Shelley do it. Yeah. So um, that's how it happened. I, I adore her, so that's what's happening. So do I. That's fantastic yeah, news. Yeah, I know. It's so, we're so newsy today. <laughs> but I'm not attaching dates to these things or locations. At or some point all in time, these things but might these, happen. But these, these things are all in the cooker.
Thank you so much for being here. Congratulations. Uh, I, I can't wait to see many, many more years of Disney on Broadway. It's well, so exciting. Um, yeah, I hope so too. And thank you for always keeping it interesting. <laughs> well, we do, we, we do try to shake it up. And yeah. Let's see if it, you know, yeah. if it sticks. Shaking it up. I love okay, it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tom. You bet. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.